Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat number 108, featuring the fourth part of my interview with the Sensible Software founder, John Hare. In this part of the interview, we talk about a lot of different things, but we mostly focus on three games, uh, Megalomania, Cannon Fodder, and Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. There's a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. John Hare. Do you have a short list of superstar developers and programmers you like to work with? I think I think yeah I think in my mind I could I could pretty much stitch together the perfect team of, of guys, um, and I th I think also that you know different different formats demand different skills, and, and one thing which I learned with watching Chris and the Commodore sixty four and the and the Amiga and some of the other guys in the Amiga as well. It took Chris to get to his third or fourth game on the Commodore 64 before he was truly a brilliant Commodore 64 programmer. You know, you need a bunch of different products all on the same machine to master it and to become a maestro of a musical instrument. You need to play the same instrument for years. And I think that when programmers are shifting from um, machine to machine as the fashions change and the totally discoordinated um, sprawling advancement of technology with no plan no game plan which which i find a massive frustration on many levels um it just demands people are constantly diverting their attention to a new medium it's like saying to an artist look i know you like charcoal but charcoal's out now you've got to use oil paints you know that, that's what's happening to to programmers especially and and you'll notice sometimes towards the final phase of a machine's life you get the old product which is brilliant now often it's happening it's coming out too late now like the machines already they don't sell it in the stores anymore and they're pushing forward the, the next version of the machine but that game could be technically brilliant for that platform and that's the kind of time a programmer needs or a group of programmers need to really become masters of their field and you know one thing which i think everyone forgets in a in a horrifically over commercialized world at the moment is that after 50 years people only remember the really massively important groundbreaking pieces of art on in the different media and everything else is just forgotten it's in the dustbin of forgotten stuff and i find it very depressing that over 95 percent of people in the games industry don't seem to care you know i wish they'd think more of their ego and less with their with their bank account we should be there trying to make that next brilliant thing you know we should be really striving to do that that takes publishers <clears throat> to back people like that to take educated gambles to not just keep on going for the safe bet and it takes developers to really push the boat out and actually to have the honesty to admit actually you know what i'm just an x-factor singer i'm not like a genius new singer bringing something to, to to the table and i really hope that um we can get out of this over commercialized cycle which is kind of sucking away all the energy of all the creative people pretty much in the in the creative media world at the moment we're forced to in order to to make money we're forced to play the the dull game and you know history will remember how many games from each decade one maybe maybe two you know how many great novels can you name from the 18th century i don't even know if i know any <laughs> Robinson, Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when they're written. But, you know, the point is that that's what it boils down to. That's where our ambition should be. And I'm not convinced I've done it yet. You know, the best game I've made, the most famous one is Sensible Soccer. I'm not convinced that it's innovative. It's not original. It's not creative enough. It's oh. a really good game. Well, but it's not... I don't know, John. What about, what about Cannon Fodder? I mean, that, that seems to be a really 
for I mean, it's a really fun, addictive game. But I mean, there's, there seems to be a profoundness, you know, profundity, uh, profundity to it. Political uh, statement, if you will. I think Cannon Fodder is a really nice. It turned out to be a really nice um, combination of a great game and um, and just the way politically it fell in place. It wasn't planned like it. Again, it evolved to be that. You know, we didn't plan to 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 have people thinking about dead soldiers and putting their names up and stuff. That wasn't the start. The start was a control system of four guys wandering around firing bullets in the screen and thinking, oh, group combat, that's not been done before, that's interesting, that's how it started. Then a few bit of level design and evolving levels, and then rank progression, then this big empty screen with guys queuing up on a hill and nothing happening, and what can we fill the hill with? Oh, graves is a good idea, this is how it happens. Okay, so we've got graves. Hmm, maybe the guys with bigger ranks should have bigger graves. That sounds like fun. And then... And then we did the, okay, so they're going to go up in ranks. So we should show the names of the guys who are going up in ranks. We should show their names going up. So you see their rank jumping up. That's cool. That's kind of like what Nintendo would do, you know. So great. So we did that. And then what about we show the guys who have died as well? Why don't we show their names going up as well? Just because they died. And then when we did it, we suddenly realized how many people were dying. You know, we didn't realize how many people were dying until we put the numbers up ourselves to just test it and up until I can't remember how far in the game the game used to be called Lemmings with Weapons when we initially <laughs> made it the internal name was Lemmings with Weapons and I can't remember if the cannon fodder name came up after we got that list of names going up you know um, but obviously it just added it, it kind of obviously captured that remembrance of the war dead thing and then you know the music kind of gets added to it and the um the poppy we tried to put on the front which was banned kind of added to another little twisty funny story yeah what's up um, with that poppy mm, we put the poppy on which was spot on i mean it was it was absolutely spot on for the game to, to put a poppy on the front about what the game's about um do you have the poppy in the states do people wear poppies I, <laughs> uh, I don't think I've. I, you know, that 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 whole thing just went right over my head with the podcast. Okay, so, okay, so, for, it, this comes from the First World War, in in uh, certainly in UK we wear them. May, they maybe wear them in France and some other countries. Anyway, a lot of people died on on uh, fields in in France and in Belgium in World War One, and I think a, a lot of this at the time a lot of the killings were must have been when there was the poppies were up. So people would die in fields full of poppies. So when they have the, like, every once a year, they have a remembrance of all the guys who died in the war, the soldiers who died in World War One and World War Two. In the UK, everyone buys these plastic poppies with kind of like paper petals. And they put them in their, like here, like here, like a poppy. And, um, and all we did was we stuck one of these on the front of the box to remember the guys who died in the war, you know. Unfortunately... The Royal British Legion, who's the official body that um, represents these soldiers, um, reacted to this by saying that it was disrespectful to the war dead to put their poppy on a computer game. Now, obviously, they hadn't played the game and didn't understand the game. And we're talking about a massively different generation of people, you know, who were not gamers by any stretch of the imagination. And... Um, and they, they didn't really get what the game was about. And they actually, the reason I disliked it was because initially they said we couldn't do it because it was morally bad. Then they said, um, they asked us to pay them money because we'd breached their copyright because a poppy was their copyright. It's plastic poppy. Uh, so we had, we had to pay it. So we paid them a 500 pound fine and, um, and we changed the box. And I must admit, I've never, ever, ever bought a poppy since because I bought 500 bloody poppies in 1993. And uh, I was quite disappointed at their attitude, really. I thought it was pretty poor. And, um, yeah, so that was that, really. So we changed it to the funny camouflage guy and the box went green. Okay, so about Cannon Fodder, I know one thing that everybody remembers is that intro song. So I was curious, uh, did you help write the song or did you... Uh... I wrote the song, it's my song. Oh, it's co completely your song. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
me and Richard Joseph um, worked together a lot on music. And what tended to happen is I wrote the basic song, went to Richard's, we recorded the parts. Richard did loads of arrangement, added loads of other parts. Um, and we worked on it together. We worked in a kind of writer, producer, arranger kind of thing. But yeah, kind of the, the war song is my song. And it's actually me singing. Oh, it really is. I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, it's too bad you don't have a, an instrument hanging around. We could have you perform at that thing. Oh, I do. I, I can do it if you want. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's let's go for it. <laughs> um, I, I do find these days it's a little bit um, higher. The, the register's a little bit higher than I can sing. But I'm, if I'm... Hang, hang on. I, I might make sure it's in tune first. It's out. Hang on a sec. It's out of tune. Guitar's always there because when I'm working, I work here, and when I'm waiting for the computer to do whatever it does or download something, I just pick it up. It's always about two inches from my hand. Wow, that's amazing! But it was out of tune. So there you go. Oh, sounded sounded great. Yeah, I don't know how we can follow what we're going to follow this with. But <laughs> uh, so anyway, you're saying earlier that you were sort of offended, really, that uh, you know, even as, as brilliant as Cannon Fodder uh, was, you know, it seems like uh, Westwood and uh, you know, Dune Two uh, seems to get all of the, all of the uh, accolades now. Yeah, it's it's. I I guess I mean, as you pointed out earlier, Dune Two was slightly before us, and I I remember it being in development at the time. But certainly, Command and Conquer got a lot of massive backing from Virgin, and they didn't really pay attention to the fact that in Europe there was already a, a game causing quite a stir. Um, it wasn't really picked up in the states. I I never understood why, you know. I never understood why I, you know, I understand why sensible soccer wasn't a big deal in the states, but not cannon fodder. I just think it was a little bit of kind of, um, you know, just not backing the guys from other countries in terms of development, which I think there always has been a bit of in the states, if I'm honest, with the exception of a few brilliant Japanese guys. Yeah, the Japanese. <laughs> I was about to say, you know, I've heard a lot of Americans complain that. Uh, uh, the, the you know the Japanese uh, developers and publishers seem to get a lot more attention and publicity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we you know certainly as Europeans we've not had a lot at all really. You know if you think back, there's not many, there's not many European developed games that people will pay much attention to. I'd probably so, say until the uh, until Microsoft released the Xbox, I'd probably say the majority of games that Americans or people from the states played were uh, Japanese. Really. Unless you're talking about the really early uh, arcade games, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, even then it was Space Invaders and Donkey Kong, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're right. You're talking about Sonic the Hedgehog and stuff like that. Yeah. All right. So I wanted to talk. I, we forgot to mention, or I forgot to, to mention, a Megalomania. I wanted to, you know, cover that a little bit. Uh, so oh, that's okay. another one of those games. It's one of the it's sort of the first, or one of the first in this genre. But it's got, you know, all anybody talks about now. I guess is uh, games like Populous. So. Uh, what do you think happened there? Well, Megalomania was an interesting game. F from a personal point of view, it's the game I really burnt the candle at both ends for the longest period of time. It was a lot of work. And and I worked on it with Chris Chapman. Oh, actually, I saw Chris today, and it was the first game we worked on together. And uh, it started off as a game about space, exploring space, flying around, shooting other spaceships, landing on planets, mining them, developing the technology, and basically in the space war. And just before we released it, we kind of realized two things. Firstly, that um, it was bloody hard to fly a spaceship and do all the, all the management of all the resources at the same time. It was very difficult to, to physically do the two things at once. So it was like two jobs. And secondly, it was graphically lacking something. And um, 
just at the same time, you know, Populous came out. It came out six months before Megalomania, oh, and we saw the little caveman guys, the little guys in the robes. And we thought, that's a nice look. So we kind of just changed our technology, really. It started off, as, a, as I say, as a space game, maybe starting something like 2100, 2200 AD. So we just ramped it back and started it in 10,000 BC with cavemen. And then we went, rather than going from the first spaceship to the second spaceship to the third spaceship, we went from cavemen to uh, warriors in biblical times to Romans and Normans and so on, you know, right the way through Victorian era, um, First World War, Second World War and nuclear weapons. It was a, it was a fun game if you've played it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm pleased with Megalomania. It's a nice little, it's a nice little cameo in the middle of what we've done. Yeah, now you said that it uh, you used some of that for Sensible Soccer. Right? I saw a quotation about how Sensible Soccer was. Uh, or what, wait, cavemen and kit. Somewhere I'm getting this uh, quotation. Yeah, okay, let me explain what happened. So, okay. so, so well, when we made Megalomania, myself and Chris Chapman were working a lot of late nights. It was it was a real pressure game at the end, and we would maybe for two or three months working every night in the office. And uh, we were playing a lot of kickoff at the time. Uh, kickoff was a, the big soccer game then, and we were both football fans, so we were playing it whenever we could. But there was a few things in kickoff that were really annoying to us. We didn't like it. So by the time we got to the end of Megalomania, we were saying, we really want to do a football game next. It's kind of a bit like kickoff, but with some changes. And um, so we... we um, the first step was to take the Megalomania guys and dress them up in football kits. One day when we were near the end of the development cycle and waiting for some build to burn, we just, I just did some art. I just took the, the cavemen and changed them into my team, Norwich City, playing football. And they were running around on the, in the megalomania world, these little football guys. And, and if you look at the perspective of sensible soccer, the, the tilt, the angle of the pitch, the zoom out, it's identical to megalomania. It's, it just, we, we literally... Um, added footballers to the megalomania world and then changed it to a football pitch and the perspective just worked we just never needed to change it which then went on to cannon fodder i guess and sensible golf and you know it became our trademark look but megalomania was the first one yeah as with many of these things they happen by accident and they just evolve so that was that all right so i wanted to talk a little bit more about the uh, you know the fall of a uh, sensible Mm -hmm. Now, a quotation I found on uh, another interview you did, I think it was with a Eurogamer magazine. Uh huh. I could be uh, could mistaken there, but you said something about how you thought uh, one of the problems was that you had re you had gotten greedy and uh, yeah. recycled some engines uh, for Sensible Golf and Cannon Fighter 2. I mean, what, what's going on there? Okay, yeah, so, so, so basically what happened was, when you had a few hit games, everyone wants your games, and suddenly you're a, you're a valuable commodity. And we were aware of this. And we were offered to do Sensible Golf and Cannon Fodder 2 and various other things. And we said yes to too much, basically. So the same guy who was the lead programmer of Cannon Fodder was also the lead programmer of Sensible Golf. But in order to save him time, save himself time, he was writing it using the same engine. So Sensible Golf is a golf game written on the Cannon Fodder engine, which sounds a bit weird, obviously. And... um. It created technical problems, it, limitations, the things it couldn't do. You know, he came to me with six months left of development and said, I can only animate, animate one sprite on the screen at any one time, which is just cripping, cripplingly dull. You know, golf is not the most interesting game as it, you know, as it sits. And we kind of wanted the, the banter between players, a bit like you get on Mario Golf. We kind of wanted that, um, even though at the time I don't know if we'd seen that on Mario Golf before that, but we kind of wanted that and we couldn't get it. And it, sensible golf is a disappointment to me. I'm not happy with it. And it, like, like as you said, it's a we bit off more than we could chew. Is what we would say. We were too greedy, we were, and it diluted our quality. And, and to be honest, I was starting to focus on the sex and drugs and rock and roll by that stage, which was such a massive game. It took a lot of my attention, and um, and so you know, between that and sensible world of soccer, I didn't have a lot of time for much else, and it just kind of slid. I want to hear a little bit more about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I saw you describe it as a leisure, a leisure suit Larry without pulling any punches. So. <laughs> yeah. I, um, is it an adventure game? Is that what we're talking about here? It's, uh, it's, it's very much. It's a, it's a kind of point-and-click adventure. Um, 
I think it was a great engine. I think the well, the, the idea of the engine was great. The execution was awful, uh, which was a big problem we had. But um, um, the idea was that the game looked like a cartoon the whole time. So you just looked at the screen. You only had had one semi-transparent cursor, and you could click and talk and listen and. And the storyline was pretty much you're the lead singer in a band, um, just a nobody band. They get signed by accident, uh, mistaken for another band, and a lazy record executive wants to go home and just signs the first band he can find up. You fly to LA, you get your hit records, you um, go through various phases. They start off as a punk band, then they become like a kind of uh, Hawkwind kind of band. And then they go into Beatles style, they find... Um, Eastern religion, and then they go kind of acoustic and disco, and they're just going through these different sort of styles of music. And all the time, the guys meeting women, shagging them, snorting cocaine, and just fairly hedonistic, but very humorous. So, you know, in the UK, we've got a big tradition of um, what we call postcard humor, or you know, it's kind of like offensive, but but. It's done very much tongue in cheek. So graphically, the game wasn't offensive. It was kind of funny and inferred something offensive rather than being, you know, over the top. But unfortunately, um, the real problem for the game was the technicality. We, technically, that we just hadn't mastered 3D. This was our problem. This was our 1995 being behind the curve on 3D problem. The program that we had in to do, it just wasn't up to it. And and we didn't find out until too late. We lost a year to year and a half of development. And and then what happened was we signed the game with Warner, uh, which was great. I mean, they, they put a, a million pounds into Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll. In fact, we signed a three million pound deal uh, with that and two other games. So we had the money to, to, to make it and it wasn't a stupid idea to do it. And we, we actually didn't lose money at all from it. But in the end, we made money from it. So there was no financial loss. Really, the problem was Warner got bought by GT. Now, GT, uh, 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 I don't even know anything about GT, but the guys who own GT are basically uh, something to do with the guys who own Walmart. They're a Bible Belt-driven company. And Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll was about shagging women and snorting cocaine. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, and uh, whether it was humorous or not, they just weren't interested. And we were stuck. You know, we... We, we'd, we'd had, from that and the other games, we'd had a couple of million pounds worth of advances by that stage. And we just didn't know how to get out of this contract. They obviously didn't want the game. Um, we wanted the game to come out, and we certainly didn't want to give the money back. And and we were kind of stuck, really. So we, we soldiered on, finishing the game off, knowing not getting paid for six months. Luckily, we had good cash reserves from our royalties from Sensible World of Soccer. <laughs> And um, we had to wait for them to tell us that they didn't want the game because we couldn't pull out of it ourselves. We had to wait for it to come from them. Um, and eventually they did. They admitted they didn't want it. Um, it got signed out, the contract. We didn't have to pay any money back. It, we also had a game called Have a Nice Day, which Chris was working on, which had some other technical problems. That came out of the contract. Sensible Soccer, 3D stayed. We weren't happy with that. Another 3D problem we had, technically. Um, we tried to sell some, uh, Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll on for about four months. But it, it required a big team. It required a 10-man art team. It was a massive game. I mean, initially when we worked it out, it was going to be on 16 discs, I think, when we worked it out at the time. And then it went down to four and maybe to two. But it was technically not managed well. Loads of art. 75% of the art was finished. About 80% of the speech about 90% of the scripting which I wrote. I mean, it was it was a massive exercise in multi-branching storyline game. Um, but unfortunately, technically, the engine just couldn't run it. So we, when we when we had tried to resell the game, which we did after we got it back from GT, we had nothing to demo that worked. Just our videos. I mean, we had a bunch of videos. If you look at the videos now, they show that they're quite dated because we're talking about very early CGI graphics. Um, but it was, it was just one of those things. We just, the timing was wrong. You know, had, had it been five years afterwards when GTA came out, people would have been falling off their chairs to grab it from us. It was just not the right time. 
And, and and people have said to me many times, well, why don't you resurrect it? Well, the answer is, well, look at the graphics. They look really dated. You're, you're talking about, I mean, I've still got the script. It's there behind me, you know? So but we'd have to start from the ground up. We've got all the music, because myself and Richard Joseph finished off an album's worth of the music, and we've done that. But it's had its time. It's gone. You know, it's a chance, an opportunity missed. I put four years of my creative life into that game. It took me about four or five years to get over it. But it's like, it's like an old relationship that went wrong and you're upset and you've got over it. That's how I feel about it. And I'm really pleased with the soundtrack. I'm really pleased I, I made it. But it's gone. The chance is gone. Something new, please. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. We'll be back next week. I will be absorbing some ultraviolet radiation. Oh, my God. In Florida. A little family trip there. Um, but the following week, I should be back either with a fifth part of this John Hare interview or perhaps a retrospective. Uh, let me know which one you'd rather see. Um, worst comes to worst, I'll do the retrospective and just release the rest of the interview. I probably got about 15 minutes of footage left. And I'm uh, thinking about just releasing that in audio form, putting it up on Armchair Arcade, and just doing the uh, retrospective. But, but let me know what you prefer. Happy to do either, either one. Uh, now, the toast this week comes from Stuart Feldhammer. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, we had a tough time uh, narrowing, narrowing down the selection, but I, I thought in honor of John Hare, I would select a, uh, an English ale. And I found a really, really cool looking one. It's called Fiddler's Elbow and is brewed in Whitney, Oxfordshire, England. So I've got rather excellent here. So let's uh, fill her up and see what this tastes like. All right, so let's give her a go. I've took the liberty of filling up old rather excellent before this because it's really difficult. I mean, let me put it this way. There's, there's two arts you have to master if you want to drink from a drinking horn. One is filling it because it's not like a typical glass, as you can see, and it's easy to pour, pour in too much beer and it'll foam up and make a mess. Uh, the second part is drinking from it. If you uh, drink too quickly or turn it up too high, it's going to have sort of slosh back on your face and get all over the carpet. And <laughs> uh, let me tell you something, guys. A beer on the carpet, uh, not, a, not a good way to ingratiate yourself with your wife or significant other. <laughs> uh, I know that from experience. All right, let's give her a go. Ah, very, very smooth. Although I'm a little bit worried about Fiddler's Elbow and whether I may come down with it after <laughs> drinking too much of this, so I'll take it easy. All right, the quotation. Now, the quotation this week is a... Uh, let me just give you the quote, and then you can uh, guess who it comes from. I think you'll be surprised. It goes something like this. I've always been driven to buck the system, to innovate, to take things where they've never been before. Mr. Sam Walton. <laughs> See you guys in two weeks. Matthew, believe it or not, writes really good poems. Oh, yes, now, he has he, written a few, he? He has he? written a few really interesting poems, and he's very knowledgeable. Because, I mean, he, he does indeed. all this, and he is good at actually bringing stuff out from people, you know, as you well know, on his, t on his TV show. He's superb, and he's a very big fan as well. Yeah. And, so uh, that's another thing. I mean, in a way, really, Matthew is like a personification of Bob Calvert, in a sense, if you see what, he is very knowledgeable. He, he has got a lot of interesting things to say. Biggles. He also writes poetry, and he also likes to come do the old gig with us, and, you know, I mean, he's written some really good, good stuff, really.